On this episode of Craft Computing, it is a desktop versus mobile PC showdown with the help of this Jingsha gaming motherboard. Premium quality, professional service, guaranteed. Those who watch my channel enough know neither of those is true. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. When it comes to off-the-wall PC parts, I'm always on the lookout for a killer deal on AliExpress. Use Xeons, sketchy motherboards, discarded AI accelerators, I've managed to get pretty much all of them working and playing games. One of the latest trends has been to place old laptop CPUs onto desktop motherboards for some high-speed, low-power gaming at rock-bottom pricing, with the latest offering from Jingsha tipping the scales at just $100. For that price, we're looking at a Micro ATX motherboard loaded with an Intel Core i7-6700HQ and an included heatsink. The 6700HQ is a 6th generation Skylake Intel mobile CPU featuring 4 cores and 8 threads with a tubo boost of up to 3.5 GHz, all with a TDP of just 45 watts. Unlike some other boards that I've looked at before with mobile CPU soldered on, this one comes with an included aluminum heatsink with a copper cold plate, further adding to the potential value proposition. The motherboard itself is reasonably well featured, with a pair of DDR4 DIMM slots for memory, a full X16 PCI Express 3.0 slot for graphics cards, along with an M.2 Gen 3x4 for NVMe storage. There's also an additional X1 PCI slot for additional cards, though you won't be using it if you have a two-slot GPU installed. For additional storage, there are up to four SATA ports off to the side. I.O. is also pretty decent, with both internal and external USB 3.0 ports, gigabit ethernet, and a basic Realtek audio driver. So, that's the setup, a quad-core Intel mobile motherboard for only $100. But is it worth the price of entry? That's another question entirely. Let's start out by go ahead and putting the board on my test bench and seeing exactly what we're working with. Jumping into the BIOS, we can see we are indeed looking at an Intel i7-6700HQ that's clocked at 2.6 GHz. I've got 16 GB of DDR4 installed, and as this one is one of the earliest CPUs from Intel that supported DDR4, it's running at 2133, likely with little hope of bumping that up. Moving over to memory configuration, the first thing I noticed wasn't even the lack of options when it comes to speed or timing controls. It was that both DIMM slots are allocated on channel zero, meaning we've only got a single channel of memory on this board. Not a great start, and the board has only been on for about 60 seconds. Since there doesn't seem to be any voltage or timing adjustments, I'm definitely not expecting this memory kit to get 3200 MHz speeds that it's rated for. I think I would have been happy with 2666, but alas, not even that is in the cards. Turns out Skylake Mobile is fickle as hell, and 2133 is all I was able to get. While getting Windows up and running, I did experience something that's going to be a persistent problem for anyone who buys this board. Sending a restart command to the board results in a soft lock. The system shuts down just fine, kills power, and then turns back on, but then that's as far as it gets. To actually get the system working again, I have to power down the board by either holding down the power button or turning off the power supply and then turning it back on. It was particularly annoying during the Windows install as it only needed to reboot about seven times before creating my user for the first time. As for performance, it was only a couple weeks ago that I benchmarked another Skylake-based PC when I put together an Intel Core i5-6500-based system from an electronics recycler. Given the similar architecture, as they're both Skylake-based, I'm expecting similar single-threaded performance overall, with slightly better multi-threaded given we actually have eight threads instead of just four this time around. In the i5-6500 review, I noted how single-threaded performance might not be the limiting factor for gaming when it comes to modern games. Rather, it's the lack of hyper-threading holding things back. By moving to a less powerful CPU, but one with four cores and eight threads, do we improve our overall playability? Well, first off, what is the performance difference between the i5-6500 and the i7-6700HQ mobile CPU? The 6500 is able to boost its frequency to 3.6 GHz and can draw up to 65 watts of power while doing so. Meanwhile, the 6700HQ can boost up to 3.5 GHz, but for much shorter durations, and it has a 45 watt TDP. Looking at Cinebench R15, we see the 6500 is faster than the 6700HQ in single-threaded performance, which is a shock to no one, scoring a 155 versus a 143, or a difference of around 8%. 
Meanwhile, the results are flipped when it comes to multi-threaded performance, with the 6700HQ being a full 19% faster than the 6500 thanks to having 8 threads, with a score of 649 to 545. Running both systems through 3 d Mark Firestrike to compare DirectX 11 performance, we see around a 4% improvement in graphics on the 6700HQ despite its lower single-threaded performance. But helping prove my point that more threads might be more beneficial in some games, we also see the 6700HQ with a nearly 28% advantage in physics performance, which is entirely CPU bound. We see similar results in DirectX 12 with 3D Mark Time Spy, with the 6700HQ again seeing about a 3% performance boost overall and a 12% gain in CPU bound tasks. Now, I didn't go through my entire benchmark suite, but there were two games in particular that I wanted to take a look at, as they had pretty dreadful performance with only four threads available in the i5-6500. And I think we'll start with Baldur's Gate 3. Not that performance is hugely important in a turn-based game, but we did get some slideshow-like performance last time around. Unfortunately, my theory that all modern games are going to take advantage of more threads falls a little flat here, with the 6500 outperforming the mobile CPU handily. The 6700HQ managed just 48 FPS on average, with a 1% low of 20 and a 0.1% low of 5. I didn't think the original results were all that impressive, but this did have me longing for the buttery smoothness that came with 9.8 FPS on the i5-6500. And then of course, there was Starfield, which had a terrible time with stuttering, with the CPU essentially locked at 100% utilization while testing. It wasn't even the average frame rate on the 6500 that made the game impossible to play, as it still managed 41 frames per second. It was the 0.1% low of 1.9 and the sometimes multiple second pauses in gameplay. The 6700HQ managed nearly identical results in average FPS and 1% lows, but didn't have any of the complete hangs or stutters as the i5-6500. In fact, we got a reasonable 0.1% low of just 16, which may not sound that impressive, but it actually made the game playable, at least by my standards, which remembers playing Wolfenstein in the smallest window possible. But now, the burning question. Is it worth picking up this Jingsha i7-6700HQ CPU and motherboard combo? Just speaking to performance, it's hard to recommend this as a platform. Skylake was never the most performant thing out there, and even first-gen Ryzen chips make short work of Intel's best desktop SKUs from the day. The fact that you can pick up something like a Ryzen 2600 and a B450 motherboard for roughly this same price means you're going to get better performance by spending your money elsewhere. I even considered lower performance use cases, like building a sub $200 PC with an RX 550, or even an emulation box that doesn't need a GPU at all. The problem is, even at $100, you're not going to get as much performance as you can from even a Ryzen 3200U mini PC. Then there's also the fact that the Erying Tiger Lake ES boards are sitting right there at about $128 right now. It's not like you're saving money on other parts either to make the 6700HQ work, as this board still requires DDR4 memory, and the heatsink is no better than a stock unit from AMD or Intel. But I also had a number of small hardware issues that further swayed my decision here. I mentioned earlier that restarting the PC was basically a broken feature, but I also had the system refuse to start from a cold boot multiple times while testing. Again, the board would power on, the fans would spin up to 100%, and then never post. Cutting the power or holding the power button and then trying again usually worked, but only after multiple attempts. It's just not a stable system, and there are higher performance options out there for the exact same price. This is going to be a hard pass for me. So that is the Jingsha H170 motherboard and i7-6700HQ CPU combo. Let me know if you have any good ideas for uses of this board down in the comments below, or if this is just e-waste that hasn't made it to the bin yet. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on social media at Craft Computing, and if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider going over to craftcomputing.store and grabbing one of my brand new Matrix-inspired Nonic pint glasses. These things are pretty awesome. Also, if you want to chat with me or any of the hosts from Talking Heads, I do have a Patreon. Link is also down in the video description, and that gets you access to my exclusive Discord server. But that's going to do it for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching, and as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, everyone.
beer for today is from North Coast Brewing Company. It is the Brother Thelonious Belgian Style Abbey Ale, clocking in at 9.4%. And the glassware for today is my new Matrix-inspired craft computing Nonic Pint. Uh, get one now over at craftcomputing.store. Makes me wonder what other kind of Matrix-inspired gear that I can make here. Brother Thelonious, my man. Stay with me here on First Impressions. Uh, banana chips, dehydrated bananas, uh, is kind of what I'm getting here on the nose. Very Belgian style, uh, you know, the, the banana and ester and, and clove. Uh, fantastic wintertime drink, in my opinion. That is a thick and chewy Belgian, if ever I've had one. Not quite as sweet on the malt side as the, the aroma might lead you to believe. It's, it's a little pungent in the fruit department. Uh, like, it reminds me of... It reminds me of like an apple wine or like an apple brandy where it it plays that line between sweet, sour, and savory really, really well. Just sitting right there in the middle. That's good. Very, very good.